Hello, everyone. I'm excited to welcome you all to this Environment and Society Discussion Series event, Feminist Solutions to the Climate Crisis, which is a special panel for International Women's Day. My name is Nina Jeffs, and I'm a Schwarzman Academy Fellow at Chatham House's Environment and Society Program. The people that have done the least to contribute to climate change are also those that are most vulnerable to its negative impacts. Women, girls, and people of marginalized genders, especially in indigenous communities in the global south, are disproportionately impacted by the negative impacts of climate change. And this marginalization intersects with other faith factors like race, ability, and age. And women, girls, and people of marginalized genders are leading innovative solutions to climate change at all levels, especially in frontline communities. Yet there's a lack of momentum for prioritizing their leadership in climate policy and action. Women are underrepresented in environmental decision-making at all levels. For example, only nine out of 140 heads of delegation at COP26 were women. And women's women-led and feminist organizations leading climate change solutions commonly struggle to access finance to maintain and scale up their work. Gender and climate change is now higher on the international agenda than ever before. Of course, the world has recognized the leadership of phenomenal women climate leaders, such as Vanessa Nakate and Greta Thunberg. The rising profile of Just Transition, Green New Deal, and Green COVID recovery plans have drawn attention to how the huge social and economic shifts required to address climate change can also generate equitable benefits across society. In the international realm, the UNFCCC and UN Women have both drawn attention to the need for feminist action for climate justice and facilitated pledges from countries, the private sector and civil society to support this goal. And kicking off next week, the UN Commission on the Status of Women is centered around achieving gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs. We know that climate change is a pressing crisis, but there is also a pressing need to find solutions to, ge uh, to gender inequality around the world. According to the World Economic Forum's 2021 Global Gender Gap Report, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed gender equality back by a generation. And we're in the midst of a global rollback of women's rights, with legal protections for sexual and reproductive health and rights being dismantled across the world and women human rights defenders now at unprecedented risk. The Secretary General of Amnesty International, Agnes Kalamad, yesterday called this a global assault on women's and girls' dignity. So what joint solutions are there to the twin crises of gender inequality and climate change? What do intersectional feminist approaches to solving climate change look like? And what can they bring to climate change communication and movement building? To take these questions, we're very fortunate to be joined by a diverse panel of eminent researchers, activists, and leaders. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is breaking the bias, and our panel will aim to address breaking the biases by exploring intersectional feminist approaches to solving the climate crisis. I'm very excited to introduce our fantastic panel for today. Dr. Sherilyn McGregor, who is a reader in environmental politics at the University of Manchester and co-author of the Feminist Green New Deal. Titi Ngozi Akosa, who is the Executive Director of the Center for 21st Century Issues. Samantha Hargreaves, the Director of Women African Alliance. And Renata Koch Alvarenga, the founder of Empodera Clima. Thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. We will send their impressive bios on the chat box for a more detailed introduction to their bio background and expertise. In terms of housekeeping, this event is on the record and will be recorded and shared online afterwards. We have an hour for this event, and during this time, we will spend about half an hour in an interactive moderated discussion. We will then open up the conversation for your questions. So please feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A function on Zoom throughout the conversation. We will invite you to unmute and ask the panel your question directly so that we can hear all of your voices. So if you won't be able to unmute and do this, please indicate that when you submit your question. Thank you. And I'm looking forward to hearing your fantastic questions. We will make as much time for them as possible. So to kick things off, I'm gonna ask you a question, Hananta. You know, we're talking about um, feminism, but could you just introduce us briefly uh, 
to this idea? You know, how would you explain the connection between feminism and environmental challenges like climate change? And why do we need a feminist approach to tackling climate change? Thank you, Nina. And good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, currently 6 a.m. for me, I'm calling in from Cambridge in Massachusetts, but it's really special to be able to start off the International Women's Day with such amazing, powerful women on this call and talking about one of my absolute favorite topics and also one of the most important topics that I think we have nowadays is a challenge, um, which is gender and climate justice. So in terms of trying to understand uh, what that means, right? I think for a lot of people, I mean, I'm from Brazil and a lot of the times when I talk about gender and climate, a lot of people don't really grasp the concept or have never heard of it, but really it's quite simple. It's really that idea of understanding patriarchal societies, understanding that due to gender inequality that we already face globally as a society, women are um, more disproportionately affected to many more issues, right? So that includes climate change. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities associated with that. We can consider poverty, talking about how women consider or constitute the majority of the world's poor. So they face greater economic challenges, social challenges, political challenges, and that um, results in this limiting of their capacity in dealings with the impacts of climate change. So we can think about droughts, we can think about floods, storms, all of every single possible climate disaster that you can think of. When you consider women, and especially women in the global south or women who are in the front lines of those communities, including indigenous women, we can see that vulnerability aspect. But I don't like to just think about the, the victim side of it. I think it's important to acknowledge that disproportionate um, effect, but it's also really important to consider women's leadership, right, in that whole process. So it's really understanding that women are already in the front lines of climate action in their communities. Here in Brazil, it's really focused on, for example, Amazon, the Amazon rainforest, the Amazon region, and how indigenous women, indigenous young women everywhere are really taking the lead and taking that step to act against the climate crisis, um, to secure food resources and income for their families. So it's important that we take those women leaders and also make sure that they're part of key decision-making spaces, whether it is at the local level, at the national level, or at the global level, you know, in climate spaces. I know, Nina, you and I have been to COP last year, and that's how we connected. And we know how powerful of a space that is in terms of bringing those people with the lived experiences to the climate key decision-making tables. Thank you, Hinata. And I'm going to turn over to Titi to ask, how do you understand sort of the concept of intersectional feminism? And what do you think that intersectional feminist approaches bring to thinking about and responding to the climate crisis? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, when we're talking about intersectionalism and feminism, what actually we're saying is that uh, women are not homogeneous. First of all, we must understand it. We have women from different backgrounds, from different places, with different orientations and identities. And when we are talking about addressing uh, climate impacts, what it means is that we must take cognizance of those differences that exist among women so that uh, we will not end up actually treating unequals alike. And that's the simple way to understand it. Because uh, if I come from Africa, some other persons come from the global north, and then it's socialized, each one has socialization processes are so different from mine. And then the way we view uh, the world, the way we discuss our cultural backgrounds are so different and our orientations are so different. Then it means that if we have to be on the table, actually to deal with the impacts of climate change, which is differentiated by gender sex, uh, and, uh, and uh, sex, at times, in most cases, because when we look at some of the experiences we have had, it now means that we must take cognizance of those differences if we are going to find a, a, a practicable solution to those impacts of climate change. And we know that women are much more impacted by the impacts of climate change. And so women as a group have been identified as somebody uh, as a group that is much more impacted by, than men by climate change. Then looking within women, the group of women, 
how where do we put our legs we have to put our legs into the different kinds of women that we have we have tall women we have short women we have uh, fat women you know we have women that are uh, highly educated we have women that are not very much educated but at the end of the day what matters is that everybody's issues and concerns are placed on the table and is addressed and that's basically what intersectionality means and applying it to addressing the impacts of climate change when we are uh, when it, it's it's very important for us to actually deal with the impacts of climate change and we see a lot of people are being impacted then it means that we must ensure that people's issues are dealt with accordingly based on the way they are based on how we find them and based on their own needs the way they have prioritized it and the way they have they have placed it on the table because at the end of the day women are experts in their own issues and whatever area and whatever situation that you find yourself you must be able to actually speak up and let people know that this is the way things are with me and this is the kind of solutions that i desire and this is the solution that will meet my needs thank you thank you tt very very well said and i think that leads us on oh would you like to jump in here samantha oh no 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 i was just um Okay. Um, yeah, I think it, it, it leads us on really nicely to to um, a question for Samantha, which is really, um, you know, the Women African Alliance is building a movement aimed at challenging the large scale extraction of natural resources and proposing developmental alternatives that respond to the needs of most African women. So could you tell us a little bit about how you work to support consent rights for women and support women's agency and leadership more broadly as part of this? Great, thank you so much, Nina. Thank you, everyone. Good to hear from you, Renata and Titi. So I think this, I, I just want to engage with this question of feminism because I do think it's such an important concept and obviously there are various variants of feminism. And so we all place ourselves in respect of like a, a position that addresses women's location in terms of economy and society. So women, we have adopted an eco-feminist orientation. And so our positioning really locates the majority of women who are carrying the costs of the climate crisis, the growing, growing climate crisis, for us, it's necessary to understand why this is the case. Why are the majority of women in the global south carrying these costs? And we need to search for answers in the paradigms and theories, as well as in the struggles of women. So we are very clear um, as feminists that we need to understand the economic structure and how this creates and fuels the climate, cl climate crisis. So we know that through oil and gas exploration and exploitation, but also industrial agriculture and other forms of extractivism, these have contributed to massive carbon emissions. And these emissions have not been shared equally. And so this whole question of who carries historical responsibility is a really important one. So for us as eco-feminists, we are very clear that this system, and let's name it, capitalism, has fueled a massive uh, crisis, not just in climate, but in the lives of the majority of people around the world. It's an ecological crisis, it's a debt crisis, and there's an absolute inability of the majority of people in the world to reproduce themselves daily. So we must locate our thinking around the climate crisis within the economic system. And this economic system uses patriarchy, uses racism, uses uh, geographic location to enable its agenda. So the reason why the global Global South is in such a crisis is because of its relationship to the center. So, I mean, in relation to the Global North, the Global South has been really the place where natural resources have been exploited, not for gain by those living in the Global South, but by those living in the Global North. And obviously, these this geopolitics has shifted over time, but we still see the Global South carrying the costs. And so our feminism has to address the economic system, it has to be ecological, um, and it has to think about a post-extractivist or a post-capitalist order. And so I think just talking a little bit around the right to say no, uh, we are seeing this as a critical piece um, of the struggle for transformation. 
So the majority of women across the continent that are facing big extractivist projects, whether that be a big infrastructure project, so oil and gas pipeline or a port or a new coal-fired power station, or a, a mining oil and gas project or a large industrial agriculture project, women and their communities are facing off land grabs of their resources, um, pollution of their water resources and air, the grabbing of forests. So when women are saying no, they're defending the very basis of their existence and their survival. And in, in, in a sense, their struggle, they are defending a wider population of people because they are saying no to extractivism, which is destroying uh, nature, it's destroying the climate and fueling all these crises. So, so for us, the no is critical in asserting the right of people to make decisions about their lives and about development. But the counterpart to that is the yes, and that's the development alternatives. And I think I'll return to the question of the yes um, in, in a short while, just to not absorb too much space. But thank you so much, Nina. That's great. Thank you, Samantha. And it's really interesting to hear you talk about how these social, economic and environmental issues are really linked through um, systems and um, and especially how those impacts are borne um, in the global south and by the most marginalised people, which I think takes us quite interestingly to some of the work that Hinata is doing um, with Empodera Klima, which is an educational initiative empowering young people in the global south to learn about gender and climate justice. And Hinata, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you've taken a feminist approach in founding and, and running this organization. Thank you, Nina. Um, and yeah, thanks to, to all of the powerful statements so far. It's been uh, really inspiring, great to hear. And I mean, that, that whole divide of the global north versus global south and kind of the lack of spaces that we've had, uh, you know, as young women from the global south to be a part of those key climate decision making discussions is part of what inspired me actually to found the Impodera Clima almost three years ago. Uh, it was really that idea, you know, I went to COP21 as an 18 year old, had that opportunity to see a little bit of the Paris Agreement discussions, but I barely saw women there in terms of, um, you know, indigenous women, black women, young women, um, those people that are really on the front lines of those discussions in their hometowns, in their communities, but really weren't there at COP, right? And there's a lot of that um, divide when we talk about where these conferences are held and uh, who is able to access those spaces. So with Empodera Clima, it really was this idea to start fostering a lot of these gender and climate discussions, bring it to the media, bring it to, you know, everyday discussions to university levels. So we started by creating this online database in four different languages. So really that idea to make it more accessible, make gender and climate conversations more accessible. So putting content in Portuguese, in Spanish and in French, as well as English. Uh, made by young people. So I think that feminist approach is really taking that, um, not only the actual feminist approach, but the intergenerational approach, right? So seeing what young people have to say in those discussions, because after all, it's super cliche that everyone says, you know, young people are the most, uh, are the ones who are going to live the consequences of what we decide today. But really, it's not just about the future. It's about what we are already experiencing, right? Uh, as a generation that's um, grappling with these issues as young professionals, as people entering the labor force. So something that we think a lot about at Impodera Clima. And uh, most recently we've been shifting a lot more into advocacy work. So uh, we've been talking a lot about this concept, which is gender transformative approach to climate curriculum. So it's really that feminist idea into education, right? I think if we're talking about young people, we also have to talk about education and how do we make sure that schools are talking about climate education in a way that brings green skills for young girls to be able to occupy decision-making roles later on in the future or bring adaptation and mitigation strategies within their school system so that if they live in vulnerable areas, they can also know what to do and become those leaders and be empowered to do so. So Empodera Clima means quite uh, literally uh, empower for climate in Portuguese or, or Spanish. And that's really the idea. It's empowering young people from the global south specifically to act on those issues through education, through access to resources, through access to those 
high level, highly exclusive decision making spaces such as COP. So it's been it's been a great ride so far working with so many powerful young people. But of course, we need more and more um, you know uh, people to be a part of this movement so that we can actually solve the climate crisis. Thank you, Hanata, and I'd really recommend uh, people to check out Imperera Klima. It's a it's a really amazing resource, and I think it's interesting what you say about broadening participation in climate change solutions and improving access, and also you know the concept of gender transformative sort of climate change education is such a good example of broadening what we consider to be climate change solutions and you know looking at social infrastructure as part of those solutions which i think brings us really nicely to the feminist green new deal um you know uh, dr sherilyn mcgregor is one of the co-authors of the feminist green new deal which is a collaboration between the women's budget group and the women's environmental network and sherilyn i'm wondering if you could just briefly introduce the feminist green new deal and why you felt it needed to be written well, yeah, hi, and uh, happy Women's Day, International Women's Day to everyone from uh, from me in Manchester. Um, it's really nice to be here. Um, yes, the, the the Feminist Green New Deal for the UK came out of um, a process starting in about 2020, where Maeve Cohen and I uh, were asked to write uh, first a policy brief uh, and then a roadmap. Um, and I think the links will be in the chat. Um, that that really tries to bring insights about a feminist Green New Deal that were already ongoing in other parts of the world, particularly um, people that have been thinking about it um, in the US. So the Feminist Green New Deal Coalition already had a kind of set of principles for a feminist Green New Deal. We looked at various um, examples from other countries and, and another really good resource for people to have a look at is uh, the, the feminist um, frameworks for climate justice reader that, that the Women's Environment and, uh, Environment and uh, Development Organization put together. Um, and so we took a lot of insights that from, from feminists around the world and brought them to bear in thinking about what was already going on in the UK. And we were in the UK quite behind many other places and thinking about what uh, a truly um, just transition would look like. So the, the, the roadmap that we developed started with a kind of critical take on what we'd already seen. So existing work in the UK, maybe, for example, the, the decarbonization and economic strategy bill, uh, work by the Green New Deal um, uh, people that have been working on this, this topic for a long time. And we, and we decided that through a feminist lens, there's some, some, some things to be improved upon. One of, one of which was that it was quite elite. So coming out of think tanks rather than from grassroots struggles, it's quite techno-centric and economic-centric. And from a feminist lens, it's really not um, sufficiently interested in addressing intersecting forms of inequalities. Um, so our vision then was to try to first and foremost make, uh, you know, call for a feminist Green New Deal to be more democratic, more inclusive of different voices, but also to integrate insights from intersectional feminism, as well as from eco-feminist political economy. And so we're really, you know, I'm not going to go through the whole set of, you know, there's about 11 different recommendations, but it's really not a liberal feminist uh, plan for mainstreaming gender into a green economy. It's about, um, you know, transforming fundamental system and, and structural change that would transform not just the economy, but social relations and physical infrastructures that lock in various forms of inter inequalities for the many and sustain extreme privilege for the few. And so our Green New Deal is trying to really identify the fact that we are in a historic moment, this moment of needing to transition out of a, a, a fossil fuel based society into, you know, that this is a, a moment that we can capitalize on, that we can think about how to transform relationships, but, we, but unless feminist insights are, are in that vision, we'll just have patriarchy as usual. Thank you, Sherilyn. And I wanted to just draw out uh, some some of those interesting elements of the feminist Green New Deal, uh, in particular, uh, some key elements of the UK feminist Green New Deal are increasing investments in social infrastructure and valuing care work, which these areas haven't traditionally been seen as related to climate change. 
So I'm wondering if you could expand on how policies in these areas can contribute to climate action while promoting gender equality and social equality more broadly across these intersecting forms of inequality that you've just mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Sure. I mean, centering care is an absolute pillar of, of feminist climate solutions. Any, any, and there's work being done all over the world again about what it means to center care as part of a climate, as, as part of just solutions to the climate crisis. And here, um, care is not an eth just an ethic or a value, although that's really important. And of course, you know, a lot of feminists have talked about an ethic of care. But really, for, for what we're talking about, is it's care as, um, as work and a set of practices that are is all about, um, you know, eco-social reproduction or in, in a sustaining life. So everything from child care, elder care, teaching, community organizing and, and the arts and stewardship, ecological stewardship and rehabilitation. And it's really important to, that we're centering care because like for a number of reasons, first of all, you know, unlike extractivist ever expanding capitalist production, which is high impact, high energy use and very life destroying, care is about survival, resilience, well-being. It's very low impact, low energy, and as I said, life sustaining. However, because it's, it's devalued and feminized, um, it is actually, we, we know it to be the, one of the root causes of gender inequalities. Um, so we can, we can, you know, in the liberal sense, we can pay women more, but they'll still have, we know that they still end up doing the, the vast majority of, of unpaid care work, which results in a number of, uh, of, of, of additional problems like lacking time, lacking, um, you know, the ability to engage in um, civil society as, as equal citizens, to engage in education for many women and girls around the world because of this burden of, of care work. So that causes that that driver of, of gender inequality needs to be addressed alongside, uh, you know, climate solutions. So in a sense, we're talking about addressing an interlocking crisis of care, uh, wh which we know from COVID that is that you know COVID has both demonstrated the vast and deep inequalities around care work, but it's also intensified this. So there is a crisis of care at the same time that we have a crisis of climate. So, so the feminist Green New Deal and many um, ideas for, for feminist climate justice put care at the center and try to integrate. So sort of thinking about integrated solutions. Um, one of the, one, an, another side project that I've recently worked on is for Oxfam. Um, and we have a report coming out called um, sent, um, Caring in a Changing Climate, um, Centering Care Work and Climate Action. And this is what we try to do in that is to think about ways to uh, address, you know, the way that the way that feminists have thought about transforming care work inequalities through recognizing the value of care, reducing the amount of, that individuals have to amount of time that individuals have to spend in care by redistributing care socially. So the, the three R's, recognize, reduce, and redis redistribute. So all of those ways of addressing uh, care work inequalities could be addressed alongside climate um, uh, issues to do with what I would like to call the three E's. So energy efficiency, ecological friendliness, and uh, making everyday life easier for everyone. Um, and there's all kinds of examples um, that we talk about in this report, which to do with investing in infrastructure and services that make care easier. So co collectivizing care through, through childcare services, energy and food co-ops, that's one thing. So in, as I say, investment in infrastructure. Can I just give you two more examples? The other example is co-housing. So thinking about how we reorganize our living spaces so that we share space, energy, durable goods and work. And the third one is the shorter work week. So shorter paid working hours would allow more time for people to engage in care and, and reproductive work at the same time as lowering our, our daily input and use of, of energy. And of course, it's no, I think, no coincidence that the countries that are leading on this demand for shorter working hours mm -hmm. are led by women. So New Zealand, Finland, and Scotland, just for three examples. Thank you so much for taking us through how these, you know, quite huge uh, social, economic, and environmental um, 
structures in, intersect, but also some quite specific examples of how we can address those challenges together. That's fantastic. And I wanted to turn it over to Titi because, you know, we've talked about um, some of the solutions being led by feminists um, around the world and women led organizations working on climate change. But while women and girls are leading solutions to climate change at a local level and, um, and, and up around the world, accessing finance to maintain and scale up their work can be really challenging. So for example, Ox, uh, Oxfam research shows that only 1.5% of overseas climate related development assistance identified gender equality as a primary objective. And out of this aid, only 0.2% reaches women led and women's organizations. So how can this funding gap um, for feminist solutions be overcome? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we're, just as you have said, we have a gap. The money is not getting to where it's supposed to get to. It's not reaching the local women. So how do we bridge this gap? One thing we must really remember, understand, is that uh, before the climate crisis itself, we based already gender inequality on the ground. And within the financial space itself, women still find it very difficult to assess financial resources. So these are underlying issues that are there before we have the climate crisis. So now that we have a climate crisis on top of it, and then the money is not getting to the local people who are in the front lines, then what should we do? We have been on the local say, working with local women, and also bringing the voices of local women into the international climate space, we have found out uh, that one of the most important things that we really need to do, first of all, is to understand how women experience climate change. If we don't understand how women experience climate change, then we may not be able to address their problems. So once we understand the way women experience climate change, then we'll be able to then ask them, their voice matters. Apart from voice, participation is power. There's a project we had like that, we call it participation is power. So if they are not on the table, where financial resources are allocated, how can the resources get to them? And how can the resources actually think about their issues on the ground? So one of the ways is for us to be on that table. And most of the time, when we talk about negotiations around climate change, it's really a lot of people who are vast in the climate negotiations that are there. Basically, mostly we don't have most of these local women on the table who negotiates, who explains all these things, who are able to explain there that this is what we feel. But if not for civil society and the alternative spaces where we bring in voices from the ground to actually put on the table for negotiators to understand what women are experiencing, what they need, and what negotiators need to do. So when you are not on the table, there's no way you can direct the financial flows. So that is one basic thing we need. Again, we understand that finances, uh, there's not much, uh, much uh, investment in women's skills already and financial uh, resources are not really flowing much to women, apart from looking at it from the climate crisis. Generally, in all aspects, financing are not flowing into the hands of women. So when we are now talking about climate change, how do we want this finance to flow to them? One thing we must understand is that we, they're, they're in, the fin in the climate finance sector, they use different kinds of financial instruments and mechanisms. These financial instruments and mechanisms are so out of this world that they don't relate to women's issues. So this financial mechanism for them to work for women, we must listen to women. We must develop this financial mechanism with the equal participation of women. We must listen to them, sit them on the table, work with them, talk to them, and understand it. Or else, these financial instruments will never work for women. These are issues we have found on ground. Then we as uh, women, maybe financial institutions, maybe policymakers, we need to put evidence to it. How do we do that? We must begin to build a business case for investing in women climate actions. For instance, for in our organization, we have what we call the women-led climate solutions. 
These are some of the things we looked at. If we are saying we have solutions, if we are saying we are the one on the front line, if we are saying we have our experiences, we have our unique issues, then we should be able to tell them this is what we've been doing. And that's why we have what we call the women-led climate solutions in Nigeria, where we put all, so most of our uh, solutions that have worked and some that we still think will work if we invest and we had received climate finance to put them to scale. So these are some of the things we need to put on the table because already there are challenges. And these challenges, if we don't look at them critically, then we may not be able to challenge financial flows to those problems. So uh, I think uh, I still have one more uh, issue that I want to deal with concerning this. Apart from having a business case, we need to support feminist movement at local, national, and international levels. Because our work with the feminist movement, especially at the global climate uh, negotiations, has really shined a big light onto what is happening on the ground. We've been able to use that international movement to showcase our issues, to also showcase our solutions, because it's not just our challenges. We've been able to showcase our solutions. For instance, in the women gender constituency, we have what we have the gender just solutions. The gender just solutions bring together all the solutions by women on climate actions, and we put it into a book. And then we also share it with policymakers at the negotiations. We train women. We also expect that from those kinds of uh, solutions, that uh, policymakers will look at what local women are doing, people on the ground are doing, and they will have that understanding on how to channel financial flows to them. So these are very important. And when we're talking about women's movement, there's one more important thing I want us to take very, very seriously. We understand that local women most of the time may not have the structures, they may not have the profile to assess international climate finance. But because we are in a movement, the movement can stand on our behalf to get resources and then distribute it to us. It has worked for me. Going, working with the women gender constituency, I've been able to assess some funding through them, work with my local women on ground. And then we need uh, some financial uh, solutions, like what we have with the small grants program of the GEF, that's also has worked for local women. But I keep saying it, it's not just small grants that can work for local women big grants also can work for us. And finally, the readiness program, programs from the financial institution, the climate finance institution, will do more to be channeled to local women on the ground to help them get ready for finance. Because if big institutions can have access to resources to get ready, then local women too should be able to have that access for, to technical assistance, to financial flows, for, for those kind of uh, support for capacity building, to get the organization well structured and to be ready to get finances. But remember that we as local women, we like movements. Most of the time, we don't want to be structured into a corporate way of doing things. So they should give us that opportunity to express ourselves the way we think we want to express ourselves. And we should be able to get uh, climate finance based on our status and the way we think it will work best for us. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. You've really laid out some very clear solutions for, you know, linking up the local level solutions with the international financial flows and really making the argument for why that's important as well. So thank you. And I think that takes us really nicely actually to, um, to Samantha, because with your extensive experience in building networks, could you share, do you think there are any lessons we can learn from past and present feminist movements to build broader coalitions for climate action? Right, so <clears throat> I just wanna reference some of the struggles that women are waging as we speak on the African continent. So women are fighting oil and gas extraction along the coastline of South Africa. Women are confronting war and guns in Mozambique because of oil and gas extraction and conflict around who will control those resources. 
In Uganda, women are facing uh, dispossession of their land for the pipeline. Um, we have been doing a lot of work on the link between extractivism, militarization, and violence against women. Across the continent, there are stories, and we have these documented, of women being raped and gang raped by security companies, by the military, by the police. These, these are the struggles that women are engaged in right now on the front line the front line of real existence, their ability to survive, but on the front line of the climate crisis too. We are seeing cyclones that have hit Mozambique and more recently Madagascar. We have rising sea levels across West Africa that have seen huge areas of land, people's houses, social services, their religious, um, their places of worship being taken. So I think when you look at women's struggles and, and why women are resisting, you understand very clearly that the majority of people around the world rely on land, water, forests, clean air for survival. That's the bottom line. We can, we can talk about the negotiations in capital cities of the world, but the majority of the world's people live in the rural context. Yes, it's shifting, but the reality is when women are struggling, they are defending the commons. They are saying to us and to the world, we cannot survive without land, without water, without forests. So we need to be listening a lot more carefully. And the reality is that the current power structure of relations around the world it's not a coincidence that women's voices are not heard. It's the way that power is structured. So we must be asking what we can achieve through the negotiations. 26 years of negotiations, we are nowhere near achieving the emissions cuts that are needed to guarantee survival for the majority of the world's people. So we have to be listening more closely. We have to be building movement because if we're going to talk about transforming and challenging power, there has to be strong movement with clear alternatives alternatives. So in women's work across the continent, we have been supporting women's organizing and movement building to defend the commons and resources that the majority of women rely on for survival. But we know that that is not enough. Women don't want to live on the land, um, suffering with access to water, um, not having access to education and health care. So as Sherilyn was saying, we need to really be centering care, but care in decisions about development, about what development looks like. If we center care, then we protect the commons, we protect the air, we protect the water. We ensure that people have the what they need to survive and to have a good life. So these are all the things that we need to be centering. Let us displace profit. Let us displace all of these mega projects that are about making profit for a few and externalizing all of the costs of pollution, of, of ill health, of, of labor to clean up uh, riverines or, or, or uh, water bodies and forests. Let us set a different agenda and that can only be done in our movements and in political struggles. So I just wanna finish off with a really inspiring piece of work that's happening across the African continent. Because this agenda cannot be constructed from above, it has to be constructed by the majority of people in the world, a different development agenda. We have been working with organizations across the continent. It's a multi-year piece of work, working with women across the region who are involved in resistance against encroachments on their land, on their rural resources, on their forests, to build a different vision that is based on a different perspective around the type of community, society in Africa that people want to live in. And, and those perspectives need to come to the forefront in people's struggles and in people's resistance. And I hope that those in power will, will listen, though I, I, I do have reservations around the extent to which they can and will listen given the structure of power in the world today. But let us sitting in places of power, in the negotiations, in the universities, in NGOs, let us take up these voices and these perspectives to present real alternatives that the world needs now. Thank you so, so much, Samantha. And that is a really a call to action, I think for all of us. Um, I wanted to make as much time for Q&A as possible, and we've got lots of great questions coming in, so I thought we would take a few at once. First of all, um, we have one from Sephora Smith, who's uh, writing for The Independent, and I'm just going to read um, the question out on their behalf 
um, as they said they're not sure if they can unmute. Uh, uh, Sephora was wondering if some of the speakers could briefly summarize what they think the role of feminism is in fighting the climate crisis. Uh, they say they, they know it's a bit basic, but they think readers would be keen to understand that in simple terms. So maybe a one or two sentence brief wrap up of, of how that relationship works. And then we also have a question that I'll just go to um, Bishop Richard Odok, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and I'll invite you to unmute and ask your question now. Oh, I'm I'm quite impressed, you know, with the program today. You know, you know, the, the women feminists, you know, addressing the issue of climate change, you know, in all over the world. Uh, I am part of a movement that is fighting a climate change in northern part of Uganda, in Achuri land, where you know, you know, tens of thousands of sea butter, you know, sea butter tree are, you know, are being cut for circle. And, and also number of things, you know, just being destroyed. So, you know, how can women feminists, you know, make the awareness, you know, of, you know, of the struggle that some of, some few of us who are trying to, you know, to, to, to make sure that, you know, the government also know and, and for people, you know, who are the culprit, because some of them are people who are in the security, you know, are people who are in the high places, which make it uh, difficult, you know, for our movement to enforce it. So how can women feminists, you know, bring their awareness and also to negotiate, you know, with some of those people, you know, in a way whereby, you know, we can, we can eradicate this kind of problem because what happened in Uganda, um, you know, it affects us here. I, I live in the United Kingdom now for 36 years, but my mom, and my family are back home in Uganda. And what's one thing that I know is what is happening in Nigeria or in DRC Congo, you know, in you know, in in those places also affect us in Europe. So mm -hmm. how can we rally together, you know, you know, as a group to you know to make sure that what we can address that issue? Because I've attended a number of you know COP26 and, and environmental what you know issue with the Chatham House, which I'm so glad it has opened my eyes. And, Thank and, and you. I'm glad that today, you know, you know, you know, all you ladies, you, you know, you bless me so much, you know, as a bishop, I feel so blessed, I feel so humble to be among you, to know that, you know, you really care. Thank you, you know, very much. That's are. very kind. And I know you as women, you have, you are very passionate, if anything, even more than we men, you know, you know, sorry to say that, you know, men who are here, you know, but that is the reality. So that's my question. Yeah. Thank you very much. So just to turn that over to the panel. So the, the first question is, if you could sort of briefly summarize what you think the key contribution of sort of feminist approaches to dealing with climate changes. And then the second one is sort of, um, what does uh, feminism bring to communication about the impacts of climate change, especially at a local level? Um, so Perhaps maybe I'll turn over to you, Hinata, seeing as you know, you're very involved in climate change communication, if you have any thoughts on that. Sure, thank you for both questions. I've been thinking about that and I saw someone else even made a comment about women's participation in, in, in the political world. And I think back to that when I'm thinking about all of this, just because you know, um, there's so many studies, I think now recently, regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and how a lot of women leaders were able to be more ambitious, be more bold in their responses. So I think back to that and I think back about how there's a lot of studies that also show how when we have more women in parliament, women in Congress, we have more ambitious and bold climate action, right? So I think in terms of feminist approaches, it's really women's participation and leadership will lead to a better world, put it simply, right? And in terms of climate communications, um, I think, you know, I work with youth and um, with Info Data Klima, we do a lot of colorful graphics and try to, uh, as we call it, um, try to make climate discussions more sexy because, you know, we all just learned climate science in school. Maybe we didn't even learn that. So it's that idea that we need to understand how urgent this is and grasp that concept that this is as urgent as, you know, other pressing issues that we have now, even though it's hard to see it, it's not really a tangible um, um, com uh, issue that we have for many countries. Of course, in the global south, it's, it's more apparent, right? And in island states, it's literally part of everyday everyone's everyday lives. So I think 
Um, being able to communicate that includes um, gathering all the stakeholders and, you know, including not just us, the youth activists, not just um, companies who are doing some things here and there, but also the governments, right? And being able to have all of these conversations between the media, the government, the activists, you know, every, every one of these stakeholders needs to work together if we want to have effective um, climate messages and climate communications that are gender responsive. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. And would anybody else like to jump in on this? Um, Samantha, I saw you, you mentioned you're familiar with the movement um, the Bishop was asking about. Yeah, so Bishop, um, there is a there's an important movement building effort underway in Uganda. Um, so if there's some way of me getting access to your information, perhaps you can link up the, the women that are fighting to preserve the Shia forest um, to this building movement. Um, I think uh, perhaps the question that I really wanted to, to put on the table was what should we as feminists be doing? Should we be inside in the negotiations? Should we be outside building movement? Should it be a little bit of both? We've just come out of an African climate justice um, uh, convening, um, which is a growing movement. It's largely uh, movement based. So communities and movements that are fighting for climate justice in Africa. And we had lengthy discussions on this question. Eventually we resolved as a, as a, a coalition of groups that we're gonna stay out of the negotiations. Last year, we did a really successful counter cop, African counter cop, including a Francophone in-person counter cop. Um, we feel that the negotiations have not yielded any success for the majority of people in the world. We feel a lot of the proposals that have come on the agenda are deeply compromised. They are not gonna take us to the emission cuts that we need. So do we stay in failed negotiations and do we as feminists sort of endorse or, or give moral approval to failed negotiations amongst governments where they are such a powerful geopolitics at play that countries in the global south barely have space to make decisions about protecting people in their nations. So I think this is a really important question for us as feminists. Are we inside, are we outside? What does it take to actually build um, a, a truly feminist perspective on this and denounce what's happening in the negotiations and the compromises that are actually being made. Um, so I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. That's great. Um, and I think I'll, we've got so many great questions coming in that I think I'll just um, ask Francesca Oberti uh, from Good Neighbours UK to unmute and ask your question, please. So my question was for um, like relating to the topic that we were speaking about before, about the caring and how women are caring and how this is under recognized, undervalued, and uh, a lot of the time it's also free labor basically that we give because it's, um, it's something that we provide. And um, it's very interesting that to link this topic to the environmental caring aspect of uh, climate change or environmentalism. And I was just wondering how uh, if we link these to environmental caring, how can we ensure that gender inequalities are not replicated? And also, how can we ensure that it's not, it's not, it does not become free labor again and is not capitalized or exploited by others or even private to pub public institutions? So um, it's, it was very interesting and I would like to know more if it's possible. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, that's such a fantastic question. And I think I'll, I'll pass that over to Sherilyn uh, to, to answer that if you like. Yeah, sure. And this is this is one of the things we try to do in our in our research is trying to think about strategies for avoiding the continual downloading of this responsibility to individual women and communities. And a lot of the focus, I think, of maybe of climate finance is to think about how to empower women economically, sort of give them uh, so this is not to say that it's not important, but a lot of it is, you know, getting women into into paid work at the same time as not supporting the, their continued burden and continued, um, you know, share of of caring labor. So the question is, how do we encourage the development of collectivized, socialized pr pr care provision that and, and that it, that allows everyone to, you know, pursue various you know, um, pursuits in, in, in society and not downloading it to individual families. And that really involves not only a social 
sort of on this part of the state providing services, but also thinking about what happens in households. And you, you can't, you know, continue to, to build the society on women, this notion that women are essentially and inherently caring. It needs to be a relationship. And the question earlier about what does feminism have to contribute is that it's fundamentally, feminism is not only about women, it's about gender relations and gender power relations and trying to dismantle this binary notion that women are do certain things and men do certain things and that we can't ever change those. Men and boys have a huge role to play in creating this different vision of society that Samantha was talking about, this fundamental structural transformation of economies and societies and politics, it's not going to be done by women. Women are not going to save the planet unless they can work in solidarity with, with their, their, their brothers, fathers, husbands, etc., partners, etc. Um, so I think that's um, a very big part of feminist climate justice is to address gender power and to change the power relations that that create gender inequality for women. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. And we have so many great questions, but I'm just going to, there's a great question from Michelle uh, Page, um, which I think takes us really nicely to looking ahead uh, to next steps, which is, um, are there any things in particular um, in terms of feminist approaches that you want to see emerge from the roadmap to COP and COP27 itself in Egypt later this year? And I suppose more broadly, you know, maybe if you could pick a key area where you think progress can be made on gender and climate change action internationally. Perhaps I'll take it uh, to you first, Titi, and then open it up to anybody else who'd like to answer as well. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, as we're trying to go for the next COP, what an important aspect of the COP, maybe bef before I really take on this question, I really need to address some of the things that Samantha raised in terms of, are we as feminists, do we want to stay inside or out of it? And I think we need to continue to stay in it, though it appears the negotiations are failing, but there are some parts of it which we feminists, we have been able to bring in feminist leadership into the decision making. For instance, for, for years, nobody was talking about gender, but through feminist organizing from outside, we were able to bring in that discussion into the negotiations. And I can still remember very, very well during the lead to COP21 where we had the Paris Agreement, feminists had this uh, opportunity to bring in gender languages, the kind of language that we want to see that will protect the interest of women. So we walked around it and eventually we were able to get some of what we wanted, but we didn't get all of it. Now, going back to Glasgow, if you look at the overarching decision, for the first time we, have, we had an overarching decision and that overarching decision also has some gender languages which were pushed by feminists who are within the negotiation. So we still have a lot to do within the negotiations because if we leave that negotiation, of course they can go on without us. And I don't, I don't think that makes sense. So as we are pushing forward to COP20, uh, uh, I, I can't remember the number now, as we are pushing forward to uh, Egypt, we as feminists need to really actually look very deeply into Article 6. And Article 6 talks about um, carbon trading and a host of there. And I remember very, very well that in the lead to the Paris Agreement, these are some of the issues we actually laid bare on the table, that we as feminists, we want solutions that are socially responsive. We don't want just any solution. We don't want all these techno fixes that we are not sure of its impact on women's bodies. And how are we so sure or that these technologies won't even spend too or add more to the climate crisis that we have. So we, we kept telling them that we don't want those languages like net zero and those kind of things they are bringing up. But then we have seen that, of course, it has reinvented itself in Article 6. And I, I remember a lot of us criticized that Article 6. But moving forward, it's there. How do we ensure that human rights approaches are adopted? when we are looking at Article 6, I will continue to insist that we don't want harmful technologies that will be a problem to not only women, but to the whole of humanity. 
These are very, very important issues that we really need to engage as we are going on to COP, as much as we are also engaging the issue of climate finance. Every day, the issue of climate finance is always, always on the table. And if you all remember that it was Paris Agreement that actually watered down the CBDR, we call it common but different uh, responsibilities. Normally, if you look at the UNFCCC convention, what it says is that the, those who, have actually, who are responsible for the climate crisis should prevent, should provide finances for those who are not responsible, responsible for it to be able to adapt and mitigate climate change. But by the time you are looking at the Paris Agreement, it has changed tremendously fundamentally. It's, it, what we are now saying is that finance, climate finance can be mobilized from anywhere and it could be loans. And these are some of the things we pushed against and we will continue to push against them. And as we go to Glasgow, we will continue to expand and tell them that this is the way feminists think about this. And this is some of the decisions we want them to take. So most of the time, we may not get everything that we want, but of course we have gotten some wins and we need to acknowledge that. And as we move forward, I believe that uh, we can still push for more. In where I come from in Nigeria, they always say that um, power is not served a la carte. And I want to say equality actually is not served a la carte. Mm. We need to continue to engage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Titi. Really powerful words and a call to action again, I think, for all of us. Um, I noticed that we're, we're just running over time, so I think we'll have to wrap up there despite the many fantastic questions. I hope you know, you'll be able to reach out to speakers afterwards and, and, and engage with them um, if you like. And I know they've also shared plenty of resources if you'd like to learn more as well, which are in the chat box. So just to wrap up, you know, we've seen that there's no one feminist approach to dealing with the climate crisis. There are many different approaches and many different practical solutions on the table that people around the world are proposing. And even within this panel, different approaches that people are proposing. And as Sherilyn outlined, feminism is about gender power relations and how these interact with economic, social and environmental systems. So a common theme throughout this discussion has really been systemic solutions, not just mainstreaming gender into the status quo, but thinking about transformational solutions in education, communications, and care, just, just as, a, as a few to list. And also about recognizing the leadership of women and fe feminist leaders that are already creating these solutions. And, you know, as TT really powerfully outlined, providing resources and support for them to scale up these solutions and link their local solutions to solutions at the international level as well. So I just want to thank all of the fantastic panelists for this really great interactive discussion today. And, uh, you know, we've certainly had a call to action from all of them. And I, I hope this prompts people to think further about feminist approaches to their work on climate change and discuss this further as well. So thank you everyone for making the time to come along today. And thanks again to all the panelists. Have a good rest of your International Women's Day.